This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. If you enjoy The Future of Everything podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This will guarantee that you never miss an episode and are never surprised by the future of anything. Today, Kalanit Grill Spectre will tell us how imaging technologies and computing are revolutionizing our understanding of how the human visual system works. How do we recognize faces, objects, and places? How do we map out the functions of the brain? It's the future of human vision. Before we jump into this episode, a reminder that if you enjoy the podcast, please rate and review it and also follow it. This will help fellow listeners discover it and make sure that we can grow the podcast. We hear a lot about the amazing capabilities of computer systems at facial recognition. In fact, I can't even get onto my phone until it recognizes my face. But the OG facial recognition, the original, is the human brain. Has the human brain evolved to recognize faces? Or have we just seen so many faces that we get really good at it? Also, how does the brain look at a face and immediately bring back memories of loved ones, specific places, specific situations, fear, anxiety? It's an all-encompassing, complicated system. Kalanit Grill Spector is a professor of psychology at Stanford University, and her group uses imaging and computing to study the visual system of the brain. She focuses on facial recognition, but also looks at reading and word recognition, and even Pokemon. Kalanit, you focus on the visual system in your work, and in particular, you've spent a lot of time looking at how we recognize faces. This has kind of been in the news recently because there are all these AI systems that are recognizing faces, but let's go back to the brain. Is the way the brain recognizes faces anything like the way computers do it, or is it an entirely different approach? Uh, Hi, Russ, and thank you for a wonderful uh, question. Uh, I'd say a little bit of both. Um, A lot of the modern AI systems are really inspired by the brain, and these deep neural networks, these convolutional deep neural networks, are inspired by the architecture of the brain. Um, However, the details uh, of the system, the architecture, are very different between a computer system and the brain, and this is both interesting uh, and... and, uh, for the CS part and for the neuroscience part at the same time. Great. So let, let's focus on the brain because we can have other conversations about AI uh, later. Um, what do we know? Uh, where are we in our understanding of how the visual system processes things like a new face or an old face? Uh, and, and what are the big challenges facing you on the research side? Um, so there's been a lot of advances, uh, especially in the last 25 years, uh, with the um, invention of functional fMRI that lets us look into people's brain uh, live when they're looking at images like faces or cars or planes or places. And what we know is that when the input hits your eyes, it gets transferred to the brain, and then there's a series of processing stages across what we call a visual hierarchy, meaning information gets transformed from one visual area, the first visual area is V1, to the next visual area, V2, and so on, and goes through from the occipital lobe, which is in the back of your brain, to the bottom of your temporal lobe, um, and then at the end of the temporal lobe, there's a, s- a system that's involved in visual recognition. Within that system, there are multiple regions, and one of them, or several of them are actually um, specialized for processing uh, faces. Other regions are specialized for processing objects or words or places and even body parts. So, so it's interesting that we have a dedicated place in our brain for faces. And I guess that means evolutionarily it was super important to make sure we knew who we were dealing with. So this is actually a question of intense debate, whether the specialization is, has developed over evolution or because we see early on a lot of faces. Since we we're born, ah. we develop this expertise because it's kind of important. We call it the visual diet, like what kind of, what is the frequency and importance of stimuli that you visually see during your lifetime. So part of the debate that's been ongoing is how much is it's carved by evolution, the specialization, versus how much it's learned through your uh, daily experiences. Okay, but but I interrupted. Please go on. So now you've said it, it kind of travels through the brain and it winds up in this area that for some reason or another seems to be focused and specializing in faces. Um, what what happens there? So it, it turns out that it's not what there happens, is that this whole process is, and this is where it's analogous to the AI system, the, the information gets transformed uh, from 
and a representation that's not perceptually useful in your retina or in your early visual cortex, like V1, into a representation that's more useful for recognition and for classifying different categories of stimuli. And basically, in these higher level of regions, the information is more abstracted from the physical image. For example, if you take two images of the same person, they're not going to be identical, and it's going to be very hard for a computer to say if it's the same face or not, just on the pixels on the picture. But once it gets to these high-level visual areas, the representation of these two pictures are of the same person are going to be very similar, and that's going to help you recognize yes. that it's the same person. So, so I know that um, one of the things, as a human, I notice yes. that there are certain faces that immediately evoke a huge um, non-cognitive, I mean, non-cognitive, like emotional responses. So I, I happen to have two grandchildren, and looking at their faces does many, many things to me physiologically. Do we under, is, is that a, a kind of, do we understand how that happens? Because there are other people, like when I'm walking down the street in New York City, literally hundreds of faces elicit no reaction. So there must be some connections between these facial recognition events and kind of emotional centers of the brain. That is definitely true. So there are connections to the memory systems that are involving like the perirhinal cortex, the hippocampus, their memory systems that invoke a sense of familiarity. Uh, so sometimes you might have a sense of deja vu where somebody that you don't really know who they right. are, but they kind of sense a sense of familiarity. And there are also connections between these face areas and also visual areas like primary visual cortex with the amygdala, and the amygdala is very much tied to the emotion. Uh, ah. that you're feeling. There are other face areas also in the superior temporal lobes that are involved not in, in recognizing other aspects of faces, like for example, your intention, your gaze, oh. your expression. And it seems that that is also separated in different uh, face clusters in the brain. Yes. Now, um, so, so great. So that gave us a nice overview of that this is really quite an amazing system. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned before uh, that uh, there's there's faces, but there's also objects and places. Um, are the are is the brain processing these in similar ways, or does it have very different ways of doing the face uh, kind of inferencing versus places or objects? So I think with faces and places, there are some sep some things that are done in parallel, and this is kind of why. I believe that these systems are, sub are actually segregated on the cortex because you might be in your room in New York or you might be walking in the street, so you'd be the same person in different places. So I might want to extract the place information separately from the face information. Second of all, uh, when you're looking at people, you tend to look at look at their face because you need to see the details. And it turns out that our vision is not uniform. Our, we see much better at the center of our gaze than in the periphery. So the but places are always all around you, right? right? right. They the entire visual panorama, field. panorama. Yeah, so it turns out that the, there is some specialization early on in these regions that the regions that be, turn to be face selective really process the center of gaze, the fovea, whereas regions that process the places are really processing the periphery. And that, that is something that can be probably evolutionary kind of determined by genetic gradient and stuff like that, and your experience with the world might kind of form these representations on these relevant uh, regions of cortex later on. So, so I know that, okay, so that, that was, that's great, and that sets us up for my next question, which is I know that one of the things you're excited about are the new technologies that are emerging to allow you to do your work in ways that might not have been possible. So can you take us through some of the biggest new technologies and how you're using them to uh, unravel these these mysteries of visual perception and cognition? Um, yes, I'm super excited about these new technologies uh, for several reasons. Um, when I started, I was really interested in how the brain function and what kind of representations might be in the brain that enable us, and this is kind of the conversation that we're having. But it, as I've become um, more expert in my field, I realized that we need to look also at the structure of the brain, and we also need to better understand the computations. So I'm really inter interested in this interface between brain function, brain structure, and computation, and how that might lead to behavior. Just to clarify, do you mean computation in a computer, or the way that the brain is doing the computations? So I'm interested in the brain is using computations, but we're using computer models to predict the brain Okay, so kind of both. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms, so when I'm talking to you about like computations, it can be very abstracted from 
the physical thing. And, you know, the computers are really good. They might be even better than people, but they require a lot of power and a lot of compute power. And as human beings, we're very metabolic efficient. Our brains fit into a kilogram or something. Uh, our skull size is finite. We eat like maybe 3,000 calories a day. Uh, we're a very efficient organism. A brain takes about maybe 10 to 20 percent of the metabolism. So um, it's expensive. So we have to be very efficient. So one of the things that um, we've been looking at with these new technologies is to understand how structure and functions are related and especially how that changes across development. Because it turns out that brain activity could affect brain structure and getting some insights of how that might happen in the developing brain is very, very exciting in my point of view. Um, how are we measuring that? Yeah, so some of these technologies, uh, so we use functional MRI to look at brain activity. There are also these new technologies uh, that look at brain structure more uh, precisely. They're called quantitative MRI uh, and diffusion MRI. So diffusion MRI lets us look at the connections between brain areas, these long-range connections. Uh, um, they tend to be insulated by myelin. And um, that helps the transmission. And then quantitative MRI gives us some uh, access to the tissue properties and we might get things like how much myelin, is there iron in different parts of the brain, and how these structures might change over time and over the lifespan. So you've mentioned functional MRI a, a couple of times. What is, yeah. where, what is the functional part of function, functional MRI? So many of us are familiar with MRI. It's the scanner. We go in, they take pictures of our brains. What makes it special and functional? So in uh, an anatomical MRI, you're measuring the differences in, in different tissue contrasts. So some tissues are more fatty, some tissues uh, are more dense, and you can pick that up with an anatomical MRI that you'd go in the clinic. Um, when your brain does uh, mental activity, uh, it is, again, metabolically expensive and you need uh, oxygen. So the brain um, has an overshoot of oxygen to enable brain activity. And what we're measuring with functional MRI is called bold blood oxygen level dependent. So we're measuring an indirect signal of brain activity. We cannot measure the neurons firing directly, but we can measure their energy uh, uptake. And that's a signal that we're measuring with functional MRI. Okay. And, and I think some people may have seen these pictures where you have kind of an MRI in the background, black and white, but then there are these colorful regions. And you say, when, when I ask somebody to think about their mother's face, this is what uh, lights up in the brain. Is that, is that the kind of thing we're talking about? So yes and no. Uh, so the, in the early days of fMRI, we were trying to understand which regions might be active in the brain in different tasks. So we would contrast activation to faces versus other stimuli like bodies or words or places. But we've really advanced, especially in the la last 10 years in computational models, which means that we can take an image and run, write a deep neural network that would predict the response to that image in each voxel or volume pixel in the brain. And these are called image computable models. So we have predictive power of predicting the response to a new stimulus, let's say a new face uh, or um, something like that. So we've made a lot of headway, and that's kind of why I'm interested in the new computational uh, technologies as well. So, that's, so that sounds amazing. I just want to pause there to make sure I can understand this new idea, which is that every area of the brain might have some a small amount of activity in response to a stimulus, and you're now able to not only map that uh, experimentally measuring it, but then go back and predict it for uh, before you even make the measurements. That is accurate, yes. So how do you how good our model predicts the brain. And this is, you asked me how do computational models help me. Yes. I, I develop these models and I want to see how good they are predicting activities in different kinds of experiments to new stimuli. And that's really an exciting area of research. Yes. And so c can I ask for a summary of that? So what are we learning uh, about our ability to make these predictions? And uh, I'm sure you find surprises every now and then where the prediction is kind of terrible. What are the kinds of situations that are very challenging for you? I think we're really good at predicting categories. So if we show, if you show a bunch of stimuli, then you have to say, can looking at somebody's brain, let's say I put you in a scanner, I look in your brain, can I, I show you something, can I guess what you're looking at? So I can guess pretty good if you're looking at a face or a word or a car, the category. It's much harder to predict a specific face. So I suppose you're looking at maybe your grand 
child's uh, face. Uh, I might be able to tell it's a child face, but I might not be able to tell whose face it is. Uh, there's been exciting papers that have come up in maybe in the last six months, three groups uh, in bioarchives that they've started to actually try to reconstruct from brain response to specific images. And I think that's really uh, exciting. Uh, this has been uh, possible also not just because of technology, but because of big data sets. So a big data set that has been collected by Kendrick Kay from the University of Minnesota together with Emily Allen. They've now scanned eight people while they looked at 10,000 different images each. So that gives us enough power to, because these models have a lot of parameters. Yes. So that has also advanced this field in, in a big way uh, because they're measuring really small voxels that are smaller than a millimeter. And for many, many images that give us power to build better models. So, th so that raises the issue of um, the generalizability of these models. So um, d do you have to study an individual, you know, however many thousands or hundreds of images in order to make predictions on that individual only? Or does what you learn about that, that individual transfer to other individuals so that you could predict for them without having the same background data? So this is a great question because what we're doing when we're developing the models, we're setting benchmarks, and our benchmark is how much one brain is able to predict another brain exactly. because we can't do better than that. So that's a benchmark that we've been using, um, and that's been uh, like this is a, the best that we can get right now. We're not quite there yet, so I'd say we're like 50% of the way, so we still have a way so, but but it, but oh, but just to go a little bit deeper, yeah. but it is true that um, observations on individual A will be helpful at at reading the mind. I hate to use that term of individual B, uh, but it's just not perfect. Absolutely. What and about this differences? Is, this is because, like, just to give you a sense of yes. why that might be, we have the same folds in the brain, but probably your brain, because you're male and I'm female, is larger than me. So there cannot be a one-to-one -one mapping right. from each neuron in my brain to each neuron in your brain, right? So how to kind of align brains is not a trivial problem in the first place. Yes, yes. Okay, That actually, that was exactly the question I was going to, which is, are there differences based on things like age and sex in the signals that you're seeing other than just trying to map them? Like, sh would you expect that if you can map your brain and my brain that we will have very similar responses or could there be differences based on differences in age or, or sex or other biological features? There are definitely differences in age and development, and this is why I'm studying children and babies. Yes. So we can see things that are changing uh, over time and things that are different. However, there's surprisingly a lot of similarities between our brains. So one of the things that we've that got me started thinking about structure is that face area are in a structure in the brain called the fusiform gyrus. Fusiform means spindle in Latin, and that basically structure looks like a spindle. That structure is, um, has a little bit of a little valley inside a groove. It's called the mid fusiform gyrus. It's really small, and it's variable in size across people. But we found that just finding this anterior tip of this region um, we, this is a very good predictor of where one of the face patches is. Huh. So I can look at your brain, and I'm sure we had a very different experience. I grew up in a different country, maybe in a different decade. I had different friends. We saw really different faces in our lifespan, but I have a really good prediction. It's like 83% of predicting your face area just from your anatomy alone, which is crazy. Yes, yes. Uh, this is the future of everything. We'll have more with Kalanit Grill Specter next. Welcome back to the Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Kalanit Grill Specter of Stanford University. In the last segment, Kalanit told us about how imaging and computer systems are revolutionizing our ability to measure the brain. It's giving us a better understanding of where in the brain we represent different things like faces, objects, scenery, and how they connect to one another. In this segment, Kalanit will tell us about how Brain regions in particular are specialized for certain kind of recognition events, and she'll tell us that the efficiency and speed of the human brain might help us understand how to build better AI systems. Uh, Colony, you mentioned maps. You, you talked about there's maps of the brain, and I just want to make sure we understand these maps, and, and what's the frontiers in understanding and computing about these maps? So 
the visual system is really interesting because there are actually maps in the visual system. And you asked me what's similar across people. This is an example of what's similar. So, for example, uh, when the information gets from your eyes to V1, the primary visual cortex, there's a map of the visual field. And it turns out that in each visual area that I told you about this hierarchy, there is a mirror reverse map uh, of the visual field. So there's one map. There's also a map of object categories in your ventral temporal cortex. So wow. again, I can predict from the activations, the patterns of activity, what category you're looking at. And that's very reproducible across people. Now, it's easy to imagine a map for the visual field because, you know, there's up, down, left, right, kind of um, having that, um, I, not to overuse the term, but having that map onto my brain makes sense. But for objects, I don't think of an obvious way to categorize them. So are you talking about a categorization of objects that is standard? standard or is it something else? So the map is really interesting because it has several structure. There is like a medial lateral division between animate and inanimate stimuli. Ah. And within the animate stimuli, you'll have clusters for faces, for bodies. There's also a cluster for written words. Um, so, and it's very reproducible, again, in terms of the topography on the anatomy of cortex. And this has been like um, really interesting for me because the question is like, are these maps just there because of wiring or do they serve a purpose? So when you asked me about the frontiers, one of the things that I've been working with Dan Yamins and Eshad Margalit and Don Finzi, who are graduate students in my lab, is trying to figure out why these maps arise in the first place and then what computational values they might serve. And so we've developed this new kind of deep neural network. We call it a TDAN or topographic deep neural network. Okay. And basically, in, usually neural networks learn a task, maybe let's say object categorization, or you can have some self-supervised learning, just learning the statistics of the world. But what we've tried to kind of implement is a physical constraint of, let's say, wiring lens. Like maybe the brain has to fit all the wires in like a limited um space so basically we're trying to put neurons that have similar activity physically we, we have a simulated cortical sheet and we're trying to uh, learn the location and the features of each let's say unit in that cortical sheet and it turns out that a very simple constraint like a wiring constraint and even with a self-supervised uh, learning um, really predicts not only brain function uh, but also the brain structure. And the really interesting thing is that it actually predicts brain function better than just having a model that doesn't have this wiring constraint. And that was for me in like an aha moment. So just to make sure I understand, uh, there is value to taking all of the, let's call them neurons, that are mm -hmm. doing similar tasks and putting them together so that they're closer, so that their connections are a little bit shorter and maybe faster, and that by that organization, you get these other phenomenon emerging that might not have been expected. Did I get that right? Perfectly captured. Okay. All right. And so now you're. So now it's a question of getting. Uh, my guess is you want to get as high resolution as possible. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you can say it's a baby, but you might not know if it's a baby that I like or a baby. Well, I like all babies. Bad example. But if it's a baby that I don't know or a baby I know. So is that one of the p uh, opportunities here? Is higher resolution decoding of the brain regions? Um, yeah, so one is the higher resolution decoding is also acquiring the brain at higher resolution and people are working on this with seven Tesla scanners that can let you have smaller volume pixels. Yes. And again, collecting a lot of data sets, maybe under different tasks, maybe all our data sets right now have still images in real life. You have a continuous stream of visual input, maybe having videos. Um, there are actually multiple processing streams in the brain, and we've actually used these topographical deep neural networks also to understand why these streams emerge and maybe give, get new insights about the functions that they might serve. Great, great. So related to this, I know you have moved your interest, as you stated earlier in our conversation, to the development of the brain and to looking at babies and, and, and learning at, at the critical early phases of life. And one of the areas you've looked at is reading and, and looking at the visual visualization of words. And, and also I know that this relates somehow to some papers you've written or at least one paper that dealt with Pokemon. So can you tell us about that work and why you're, what the questions are that you're asking and, and what are you learning? 
So the reason we started looking at kids is that we noticed that the adults' brain are very similar. As we discussed, I can predict where your face or place area is just based on anatomy. And we were interested to know why that might be. And words are a particularly interesting um, category because we all are not born with the ability to read. And it's probably too evolutionary recent that has been carved by evolution. And also, you start really becoming expert in reading when you go to school, and it's around like five to seven-year-olds, depending on the kid and the country. So this really gives them an opportunity to see how your experience during childhood leads to the development of new representations in the brain. Um, and uh, there's a study by a group uh, in France. Uh, her name is Jilan Lambert Dehan, and she showed that this word region emerges during the first year of schooling. And what we found is that it, it continues actually to develop quite a lot between like age five or six all the way through 17. And it's also these higher, even the faces you might see early on, even your regions that are involved in processing faces continue to develop in childhood in quite a profound way. And you're actually better at recognizing faces in adult than you were when you were five and six year old. So that was kind of really interesting. Um, and one of the surprising things that, and so we were basically measuring brain responses in children over a span of five years. So we can really see the same pixel in the brain, voxel in the brain, how it changes yes. over time. And uh, what we saw is that uh, as specialization for faces and words builds, it, um, we actually saw a decline in the specialization for body parts, especially for hands. And that was really unexpected. And yeah. Because it's just like people think that maybe experience chisels your brain, but you didn't think that the experience might really change. It, it, maybe even changing your priorities and or uh, where yeah. you focus your cognitive capabilities. Yeah. So I really think it has to do with the frequency of the stimuli and like your task. Maybe a lot of like you've mentioned social cues. There's a lot of social cues and faces. And you get a lot of expression and like subtle things about um social cognition from eye uh, movements and stuff like that. But maybe uh, when you're a little kid, you get a lot more information, let's say, from um, more bo bigger movements, let's say, pointing or... Uh, and then that becomes really inappropriate later on. Also, the number of faces and number of words really increases uh, over the lifespan. The words are longer, more complicated, you know, m many more faces. And maybe that's why these regions really take a very long time to develop. And how does any of this relate to Pokemon? So Pokemon, so it was pretty clear that, so I told you about the debate about faces, whether it's innate or not. It's very clear that words, um, you have to learn. But the question is, maybe words are special. Maybe it has to do with something about, you know, symbol systems or culture. And um, so we wanted to know if there's a, a more general pattern to this. So uh, my graduate student at the time, he's now a professor at Princeton, um, Jesse Gomez, had his own experience as a kid playing the Pokemon game in the 90s. So it was like this Pokedex. You hold it in your hand. It has really... Um, not to standard graphics, they're pixelated objects, they're small, they're black and white, and it's kind of a controlled stimulus set because you kind of hold it in your arm length. So there's some variability, but... And they basically, we were looking at kids that... We are looking at adults that had kids between five and eight spend hundreds of hours kind of identifying these Pokemon stimuli uh, and could really determine the difference. And comparing to people like me who can tell Pikachu from everybody else, but that's about it. Right. So they, they, they I see where you're, I see where you're going because you're talking about did this take a part of the brain that then de-emphasized other things that may may have been emphasized if they hadn't been looking at Pokemon so much. Yeah, so we don't know. Yeah. So we wanted to see whether your former representation, whether it not it, it could not de-emphasize anything. Right. It could be just you. Maybe you have capacity to right. code anything, right. right? You have like in the end of the day, billions of neurons. Who said that you have to push de push something anything. out? Right. Maybe you don't have to right. push anything out. Um, so, and the other thing that the Pokemon were interesting is because I told you with faces. We know that you're looking at them with a phobia. Words, you're also looking at them. Uh, you have to look at words uh, with a center of gaze. This is where you have your highest visual acuity. And then the Pokemons kind of like really tiny and small. So you also need to look at them with a 
center of gaze, but they have other characteristics. They're very pixelated. The place areas really like these uh, vertical and horizontal lines. So maybe if it's just something about the visual features, it might emerge on the place area. They're also kind of like animate, so maybe it's really going to align with animacy. So it actually lets us give a much more specific hypothesis about, one, if the representation is going to emerge, and then where? Could we yes. predict it? Could it be consistent across people, even though it's a really contrived stimuli, right? Right. So what did we learn? We learned that, one, People who are Pokemon experts do have a, a special representation for Pokemons. It's not like a cartoon general representation. It's really specific to Pokemons. And it turns out that it shows up on the regions of central gaze. So how you look at the stimulus really affects where this representation is going to form. And it stays to you till adulthood, even then you stop being interested. Right, right. Maybe Pokemon, maybe in your teens, or maybe you've never stopped. Now, you mentioned that in the learning of words that there seemed to be a downgrading of hand focus. Did, did, you, did you see, for the Pokemon, do we have an answer about whether it's taking its own new space or is it crowding out other uh, kind of perceptive capabilities in the way that you said that the hands might be downplayed by the growth of words and faces? So I, unfortunately, I can't answer this question. I could answer it in the children because I measured them over five years. So I could go at the end region and see, go backwards in time and see what happened to it when they were five-year-old. But here I've measured adults. And right. unfortunately, I do not have a time machine that I can go back in time and, and see what it was when they're five-year-olds before they knew anything about Pokemon. Yes. So just to finish... Uh, um uh, up, I wanted to talk about your new interest or your new focus on the development of the brain, and we've already been talking about that a little bit. Um, are are the technologies for making measurements all appropriate and where you need them to be to do this work, or do babies and 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 little people uh, create new technical challenges for your measurement capabilities? So uh, I'm very excited about the babies because we think that these uh, have. Uh, the biggest development, uh, and this is why we're looking at them. Also, we know very little about the baby brains. And one of the things that was really striking and surprising to me is that the baby brains look very different than children's brains. Um, the structures are not only smaller, uh, they don't have myelin in the brain, which really puts us at a lot of technical challenge. So we have to develop new tools <laughs> to analyze as a field um, yes. baby brains. Uh, and I always like to be in a, a, in a field that has a lot of new challenges because that's going to lead to a lot of new discovery and a lot of new technology development. And that makes it extremely uh, exciting and a hot field to be in. Fantastic. Well, thanks to Colony Grill Spectre. That was the future of human vision. You have been listening to the Future of Everything podcast with Russ Altman. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider rating and reviewing and following it so you'll receive news of new episodes. Maybe tell your friends about the podcast as well. And definitely rate and review. We have more than 200 episodes in our archives, so you may want to poke around there for the future of lots of other things. You can connect with me on Twitter at RB Altman and with Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.